Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. Cabby Richards joins us. Cabby, for, for all of us Americans that may not know about your whole backstory, who who are you, man? I'm just, I'm a kid from Toronto and I do these kind of bizarre interviews uh, with people like yourself, your peers, and sometimes some entertainers. And I'm just a little bit strange. I mean, you know, Canadians, we're like we're very friendly and generally nice people. We're just a little bit weird as your as your neighbors to the north. Why is that? Why are Canadians so nice? <laughs> um, you know what? Um, we have some brutal winters, bro. The winters are so so like, you know, we have the shared experience of like eight months of the year that we're just like in the like the bitter cold and perhaps our, we form a community based on we always you know people talk about the weather and stuff but because ours are so harsh maybe it just it just um it just makes us nicer i don't know i'm not exactly sure but i think that's probably part of the reason why we're we're perceived as quite nice actually we are nice not perceived but we are nice you are canadians seem to just kind of go with the flow and maybe it is that that winter deal where you guys are all huddled together for eight nine months out of the year and you're around each other so you're forced to, to, to be nice that's just the culture yeah, man. And like, it's, yeah, it's the bond. It's the shared experience. It's, you know, we're like your guys. We're like the 51st state. We're like the younger brother. So we have a little bit of insecurity about us and we kind of, we, you know, we huddle around that as well. So that, that definitely helps to shape our identity. So I think the only other Canadian I might've had on here was uh, Jay Onright. Are you aware of him? Of course. Yeah. We used to work together at TSN, which is like uh, ESPN in Canada. And he moved to Fox, I want to say two years ago, maybe three years ago, FS1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I know, Jay. Yeah. How does that work? So you're you're currently still employed by TSN, correct? Correct. Correct. How does that work? Because you, you're on Sports Center, spelled yeah. weird for us Americans, <laughs> C-E-N-T-R-E. Like what right. is, how is that affiliated with ESPN? ESPN owns part of TSN. I think it's 20% or 30%. So we have a big giant cable company like a Comcast that owns, you know, a bunch of, you know, um, media outlets and radio stations and such called Bell Media. But that 20 or 30% is owned by ESPN. So that's how TSN licenses the, the look, the graphics, the same kind of logo. And we are of the British English. So that's why we have RE as opposed to the American ER spelling of Sports Center. So where are you from? I'm from Toronto. You already said that at the beginning. My bad. No, that's so, all right. Dude. That's all right. Do you? Uh, so I mean, I don't even know how to describe you. That's what's cool about your whole story and what you do. That's you have cool. these. You do this. Cabby, Cabby presents. You've done for a while now, and it's like Thanks. the if you look down the laundry list of people you talk to, man, it's like a who's who in all sports, but entertainment. It crosses over. I was I was just watching your. Uh, you had a little stand up with with Drake and talking about you gave him all these business cards. Oh, for, thanks, man. Yeah, thanks. for like all these different yeah. things. And the, I know you've heard it before that you're like you have this disarming persona or whatever demeanor. I try to. Yeah. Is that how you did you have that going in? Like when you originally started doing this, did you know that was going to be like your niche? No, uh, no. But I, I I'm very much like just a a sweaty rhinoceros. <laughs> so I'm like I'm generally that's kind of how I am in real life. So like I'll touch people, like I'll put my arm around dudes. Like this one time I interviewed Phil Jackson and he was, first of all, Phil Jackson, people don't know, that dude is at, runs practice or used to run practice in flip flops and cargo shorts. <laughs> like when you're that much of a G where you got six rings with the Bulls and five with the Lakers, I guess you could just dress however, but that's how he would, um, you know, and also, also I saw Bill Belichick once in uh, Foxborough and that dude was walking through the uh, the locker room in flip flops as well. It totally kind of freaked me out because you see these dudes and they're you know Belichick so stoic, and then you know Phil Jackson is the Zen master, and I saw, and then you see like their their footwear, and my guy, the, both these dudes are in friggin' sandals. I think Phil Jackson was wearing stocks as well, which would add to this whole Zen master thing. But anyway, so about this army, I put my arm around Phil Jackson. That dude's like six nine. I'm only six feet tall. So I'm like stretching and put my arm around him. And he's like, hey, listen, you can talk to me. You can ask me questions, but don't put, don't touch me. <laughs> and it was one of the most awkward experiences of my life. But I'm generally like that. Like when, when I, when I, you know, when I touch somebody, I'm just, it's just my way of telling them like, we're the same. We're, I know you have this unbelievable talent and people revere you because of your talent, but you and I, we're just dudes. We both eat chicken wings. We love girls. 
We friggin' when we're watching movies on the couch, it's we're just crushing chips. We're just the same dudes. So that's that's kind of and and I just that's how I've been forever and and it just continued. And luckily nobody's punched me in the face. Although some people have looked at me like Demarcus Cousins, I feel like he would have punched me in the face had the interview gone on another ten seconds. I was gonna get to that. Like wh- who would who would you say would be your your most challenging subject to talk to? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you know, some do. That's a really good question. The most challenging, you know, who was tough was A Rod. Was tough um, when he Alex, like, Rod- Alex Rodriguez. Yeah, Alex yeah. Rodriguez. Yeah, he. I once asked him. You know, I'd asked him maybe like eight or nine times to do an interview, and finally said sure. He goes, uh, I'm like, oh, I have like a couple of questions, and for uh, an interview or a couple of questions means like you know anywhere from like three to five minutes. A couple of questions is really like three to five questions. Mm-hmm. But for him, he was like, no, literally two questions. So when he came out from the clubhouse and we're on the field, he was in Toronto, he was in Toronto, but playing for the Yankees. And I was like, Hey man, how you doing? He's like, I'm good. And he goes, one more question. I'm like, wait, no, that, no, that wasn't the first question. That was just a, so then I actually got to squeeze in a third one, but he was serious about two questions. And it was AJ it was a maximum of like, I think it was a 57 second interview. It was like in and out. I asked him about walk off home runs and celebrating with his teammates and like where he throws his hat. And that was it, dude. It was just like, so he was, he was a tough one. More recently, um, I would say DeMarcus Cousins when, when the NBA All-Star Weekend was in Toronto in 2016, I was doing this bit about like, um, like uh, basketball players, when their names get mentioned in like hip hop songs, does that validate them as cool? And he didn't understand my question. And he was like, huh? And one time he was like, why are you standing so close to me? I'm like, so you can hear what I'm saying. He goes, no, I can hear you fine from over there. <laughs> so it created a moment of awkwardness. But sometimes those are funny on TV. How do you how do you fight through that? I can imagine it would be that would knock me off my game big time if you were so if someone was really cold to me. Yeah, no, it's it's not fun. But it's like <laughs> But like people really relish in discomfort. I mean, dude, we could spend, we can go down a YouTube rabbit hole for 90 minutes, just just punching up awkward. Yeah. And we would see either awkward t- TV interviews or, you know, first kisses or whatever, uncomfortable moments in like Congress or parliament or whatever. And it's just so entertaining for us. So in those, I just have to get through. And, and plus, you know, you know, as an athlete, you, you're really, you're, your availability is only a few minutes. You only get a couple of minutes with someone and then someone else asks a question or, you know, the athlete has to go get treatment or whatever. Like you guys, it's a small window. So for me as the interviewer, I just got to get my questions in and then just keep it moving. How do the other uh, media members feel about your interview style? They, they don't like it. Dude, I used, oh my gosh, man. They just, like I used to, I still cover hockey, man, from Canada. So hockey's like, hockey is the NFL of yeah. Canada. Oh yeah. And it's such an old boys, old boys club, man. When I first started, I was like, I would wear t-shirts, baseball caps. Like I did not look like a traditional reporter. Wasn't wearing button ups. Didn't have the old school friggin' notepad or like that cassette recorder. I was very, I was the same age as a lot of the players. So the players, they enjoyed it because I wasn't asking them about a concussion or a losing streak or anything where they could give cliches. I was like, you know, when you get into the arena today, what were you playing in the car? What would you sing at karaoke? Who's the smelliest guy on the team? Like just random things that we would just talk about outside of outside of the arena. So and I, and so I would get more time with some of the athletes. Of course, I would wait till everybody, all the other reporters, had got their time in. But I was getting laser beamed with serious cut eye and side eye. But man, I just had to. I just knew I had a couple of minutes. I had to do what I came to do and then bounce. But yeah, they they didn't they didn't like it. Man, I, I can imagine if, because like you said, that short window that the media has, so say that there's 15 of them waiting to speak to one guy, maybe Sidney Crosby, and they see you walk up, and they probably see Sidney's eyes kind of light up too when he sees you. He's like, oh, Cabby's here. Cool. It's, it's actually going to be fun. I'm not going to answer like, oh, what'd you do minute 17 in the third period right, when right, whatever right. happened and, and getting into like, the serious stuff when he knows cabby's going to come up and have some crazy bit and probably bring some props and actually oh, see this thanks. guy really like light up probably thanks it, it happens like that sometimes and like i've been fortunate because some players will just like retreat to you know you guys have the locker room or in hockey that there's a dressing room but you guys will like hide in the back <laughs> until like the, the media will leave and then you'll come out or whatever so some guys 
if I had a pretty good relationship, they'll come out and give me, you know, three to five minutes. Okay, so what was it like when Kenny Mayne used to come around your guys' locker room? Because he would, he would either do one or two stories a year. I think I think he had a pretty good relationship with Brett. So what was it like when he came for you guys? And you're like, oh, I'm sure Kenny Mayne's doing something. When you see him, you're like, okay, I want to, I want to watch this. What was it like for you guys? Man, you're right. That's a great comparison. Kenny, yeah, it was, it was like a known thing that Kenny was on the premises and people were like, oh, I wonder what's what's <laughs> happening. What's he going to do? And I, he did a couple things with some O-linemen in Green Bay multiple times and they loved it. But he wasn't really in the open locker room session with all the beat writers and everybody. Kenny was, he, oh, he had so okay. much clout, I think, that he was kind of, he didn't have to come in there and search him out. Like it was a known coming in that Kenny was going to be there and this is going to be on a separate, different time than the open locker room where you're going to do your Got bit it. with Kenny. Okay, okay right. Because he, he's like, Kenny, for a long time when he was doing uh, the main event, he, although we have com- totally different styles, his his segments were to entertain and not so much inform. Like, much like myself, I want to entertain the audience. I'm not like Schefter where he has to inform or Peter King, they have to inform the audience. We, we have it in some ways a little bit easier because we just want to have a good time. And, um, and I can imagine like when, like the guys would light up, they would have, okay, you know, I can let my guard, I can let my guard down and I know this is just going to be a fun bit. So it's, I, I, yeah, I can, I, you know, I could see how it would be, it would be fun for the guys when he came around. Did you ever, uh, have that pull to be the guy that switches to like a more serious role? Um, no, nah, maybe eventually it'll come. Like if I'm like 68 years old, you know, I'm, the, the chances that I'm going to be doing friggin' pushups with some 21 year old stud out of the Ohio state was going to be slim to none. Or like a few years ago, I was racing Adrian Peterson on these like mini bikes, like bike a bicycle that you would give to a five year old. And I went to his camp in, um, just outside of Dallas, Texas. And he's like, He's like, what? And he'd never met me before. He knew nothing about me. And I was like, well, let's challenge you to a race. And he's like, a race? Like, with what? I'm like, boom. And I pointed down the track, and there are these bikes that we'd set up. He goes, like, okay, okay. Of course, he beat me in the race. But, you know, when I get older, perhaps I'll, I'll pivot or transition into something a little bit more serious. But for now, I'd like to do this for as long as I can. Now, you have a bunch of stuff with Kobe. I mean, obviously, I have a ton of oh, – man, I got so many questions for you. Just because, like like I said, the list of people that you get Thanks, – You get to, like – you hang out with him like you have this on what's the ongoing bit you got with Kobe when he the phone number deal <laughs> it's uh, it's it's uh so like about 10 years ago um I just kind of Kobe was in Toronto once and it was it was like the year after that whole ordeal in Colorado mm-hmm. so like his public appeal was pretty low like his Q rating was low like only Nike kind of stayed in the Kobe business McDonald's had severed ties and um Nutella and some like some other one of his other prime endorsers so anyway so here I am just this chubby reporter from Toronto and I'm asking him some doing a question about um the bandwagon fans and like what he thinks about bandwagon fans and if he could physically draw a bandwagon I had this pad of paper and a sharpie and he didn't want to draw but at the end just as a throwaway question AJ I was like hey listen the next time I'm in LA can I just stay at your house he's like you want to stay at my house I'm like yeah he goes all right you can stay at my house so the next time I interviewed him I'm like hey what's your address and the next time I interviewed him I'm like hey I went to that address but you weren't there what's your phone number he's like 1-800 never ever call me ever so the next time I saw him, I was like, hey, man, I tried that number. It didn't work. He's like, did you use your cell phone? I'm like, yeah. He goes, you got to get a new cell phone. So we had that sort of narrative of me trying to stay at his house. So every time I went to Los Angeles, was, I just added another layer to me. Like I made him a key for my house. I brought him pajamas. We took a limo ride. Eventually, we took a heli- I got to do an interview with him in his helicopter. Because I don't know if you knew this, but he used to fly from – um, this one airport to the practice facility. Then on game days, he'd fly in a bigger helicopter from the same from the practice facility to downtown LA, land on a friggin' skyscraper, and then have like a a black car drive him to the Staples Center. He dropped thirty five, and the wifey would pick him up, and then they drive back to Orange County. That was his life for several years. So I got to do an interview in that helicopter. Wow, I, I was I, I knew that you got to go in that thing, so that's that's legit. He really rode. Did he ride to practice in the helicopter? You yeah, dude. So he would drive to this like this airport in Santa Ana, um, California, and would fly to LAX. And the practice facility for the Lakers is like a five minute drive from LAX. So in this would save him about an hour and ten minutes um, 
each way. So two over two hours on the road of him driving by taking a helicopter. And I was like, I was like, Bean, I call him Bean. I'm like, yo, Bean, how much is this to have a freaking helicopter every year? He's like, oh, it's about the cost of a Ferrari. I'm like, a Ferrari's like a quarter of a million dollars. And he just shrugged it off. I'm like, you're such a G. Man. Like, That's just gross. Gosh. I was, I was at a uh, the Hall of Games award. It, it's, uh, it was like Cartoon Network, I think. It was like the, oh, okay. year, the year after we won the Super Bowl. And it was at some airport hangar. I don't know where it was. I don't know exactly in California where it was, but... I had to leave. I like I did a little thing and then got out of there and had to fly home to Ohio. But I I was so pissed because I know I heard Kobe came that towards the end and he presented an award or got an award and they said when I was driving off they're like oh Kobe's coming in on his helicopter he'll be here soon and I was like yeah yeah all right man and I thought they were joking but they're dead serious they flew him in and <laughs> since it was at an airport I guess he landed right there went on what? got yeah. his award and said see you and took off. Oh my that's yeah that's so ball I haven't heard. And when Steve Nash first got to LA, he would also use Kobe's helicopter. But I haven't heard if he used it, like if he still uses it or what. I mean, I know he's making big moves in the finance world, but I, I wonder if like the helicopter is still a part of his life. I got to ask him next time I see him. Oh, you have to. Kobe's an interesting subject. I feel like it's something that I talk about a lot with with one of my brothers that we love watching Kobe's interviews over the last five or six years. Maybe it seems like he just he doesn't care anymore, man. Like yeah. he's going to give you the truth and he's going to, yeah. he cusses in his interviews. He's so authentic. It seems like he's like, you know what? I've, I've hit, I've hit the bottom. I've seen it and I've come out of it better than anyone's come out of a situation like that. And now he's just going to, he's going to speak directly exactly how he feels. And he's not going to sugarcoat anything. Have you noticed that with him? 100%. It was like the Kobe that wore number eight was trying to be Michael Jordan. And then when he went to Kobe in the 24, it was, it's like, towards the end of his career he definitely gave zero bleeps like he and you know maybe that just came with age or he had already accomplished so much so he was so because of his his status he could be like yeah just cursing in interviews and just not giving a crap because he's like i'm kobe bryant so uh it was it was refreshing and so entertaining for us as kobe fans i'm a kobe guy i don't know are you okay here's how about this are you a kobe guy or are you a lebron guy uh, can't you be both? Yeah, you're an Ohio guy. Yeah, you can be both though. I, I, what can I, I can be both. No, no, no. You get, yo. There's, there's, there are two camps. You can't be both. No, you see, have to be either a Kobe guy or a LeBron guy. See, that's the great thing about not watching a ton of NBA basketball. I can be both. No, but okay, but okay. How about this? You're, are you a Manning guy or a Brady guy? I mean, I never thought about it. I guess I don't know. I don't. I don't. I've never. I never had to choose sides. Why? Why do I have to choose sides? I, I just feel like for sports fans, there there's because there's so much comparison shopping. Th yeah. There are like there are, there are athletes that have rivals or athletes that have um, peers that they're always compared to. So like in soccer, it's Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. And I'm Ronaldo. Fans, I'm Ronaldo for the record on that one. Okay, you're Ronaldo guy. Okay. Yeah. And like, um, there isn't really one equivalent in baseball because baseball isn't so much one on one. I mean, it is. It's like, well, it's more like batter versus nine players. Mm -hmm. But like in hockey, it's either you're a Sidney Crosby guy or an Ovechkin guy. Are you either one? True. Boy, that's a tough one, man. I love them both. Gosh, man. You see, you're at your. I, I don't want to have to choose with the, between. The, it's like picking your favorite kid. I have three kids. No, I'm not going to pick like my that. favorite. <laughs> I'm not that invested. I love hockey. I really do. I've gotten into it over the last couple of years as well. But I, I was lucky enough to watch Ovechkin play in Columbus a couple of years ago when they came. And that dude, see, I, this is I'm completely ignorant about hockey, but I like to watch it. That dude posted up wherever his spot is when he just yeah. fires those one timers. Yes, yes. And he was posted up there, and no one was knocking him. Like he's so big, they couldn't get him out of there, and they were just tossing him just feeding him up and he was just firing these one timers at the net all night long and the fans around me lost their mind like they didn't know they could not handle it. what are you doing you're leaving him open i'm like dude this dude is a monster you go try to push that guy around and novechkin yeah. he was so fun to watch though but i respect sydney's i i ask that's the thing i ask hockey guys when i when i'm around them cuz it being in Columbus, I get to go to a lot of Blue Jackets games. My brother-in-law plays for the Blue Jackets, so like I've gotten. Oh, nice! Yeah, I know the I know some guys, and I always would ask them like, "Hey, man, is Sidney Crosby really that good?" And every single one of them, bar none, says, "Yeah, he really is." 
And I think I think it comes down to styles, like a style preference. Obviously, Ovechkin is way more flamboyant. He plays with a certain like a freestyle element, and he's he's a scorer. Crosby is he's the playmaker. So you and then like in LeBron, playmaker. uh, Kobe, a scorer. Um, And in soccer, it's both guys are unbelievable scorers and playmakers. Um, And and then so yeah, and Manning and Brady, sort of like Brady's really fiery and feisty, and Manning. Seems to, I mean, they're both kind of golden boys, but Manning doesn't really blow up his teammates on the sideline as much as Brady does. He's not, Manning isn't the fiery fist pumper that Brady is. So there's like, there's a style, style preference. Uh, yeah, I think you hit it right there. It's definitely the style thing. And Ovechkin is like the big old bruiser. He's not scared to fight every once in a while. He'll, yeah. he'll, he'll mix it up. Yeah, he'll mix it up. And he, he's not scared to go. I, I just saw a thing last year when they, uh, their game got snowed out, and he's out there with a snowblower at the gas yeah, station. Did you see right. that? That's right. Yeah, he's yeah. filled up his little red five-gallon can of, for gas. He's like, oh, the snow machine, the uh, snow machine I go to. And he's going to get with his, yes. his broken English. And then they found out later he was he like did the neighbor's driveway with his snowblower because he was so like excited to use it. Yeah, that's – yeah. So And then he has – he has like a ton of fun and hockey culture is weird, man. I mean, your, your, your brother-in-law could tell you they suppress the personalities of the players, much like the Patriots do, you know, like, was it Welker or Edelman got fined or got like, they had to miss a game. Cause they're one of them was kind of being funny in a press conference and Belichick's like, yeah, no, you, this was, is like, you're not having fun over here. We just came to win, but you wait, you kind of skirted the Brady versus Manning. Okay. You didn't say which guy you are. See, I can't, I, I've never thought about being, I don't want to, I can't pick a guy. Cause I, I played football. I play football. Like I don't, that's not, I don't want to pick a guy. I'm an Aaron, <laughs> Ro- I'm an Aaron Rodgers, Andy Dalton guy. I played with both of them. <laughs> That's fine. To I, play I love, has Rogers been on your podcast? Or yeah, podcast? yeah, I had him on. Uh, he he he. We did almost two hours with Aaron uh, back in like May. Uh, you should go oh, watch sick. him, man. He was cool. I actually asked him. I think about the whole Kobe thing. Like I felt like Aaron's been a little more open recently and not as guarded. Being uh, as he just gotten, he's gotten older. I think he's just more comfortable and doesn't care as much what the perception may be of him or what he didn't. He's not worried about offending people. I, I guess as much. But also, you're a friend, so like, there's a level of trust that he has with you, and obviously, this is a public forum, and people are going to consume your podcast and stuff. But the, the trust is like a big thing with him. Like, if you, you know, and and you would know, you have certain reporters that you have a bond with, and you can tell some things, and some reporters you sort of keep at arm's length because they haven't earned your trust. You know, when I was covering the um, NBA playoffs. Uh, the Raptors went to the conference finals against, uh, I don't want to say your Cleveland Cavaliers, but you are an Ohio guy, so yeah. maybe by proxy you are a Cavs I love. I, I sure. do like the Cavs. I, I love the Cavs, but I've, I've, grown up, I've been a Kobe guy my whole life because I was a Jordan guy, and I'm still – I'm a Jordan guy above everyone else. Oh, okay, okay, sick. So I noticed that, like, you know, there's a press conference, and after every playoff game, the stars would go to the press conference. But so um, much like – how Schefter or Jay Glazer in your sport, they are like the main insiders. Adrian Wojnarowski is the guy in the NBA. And players would stop in and talk to Woj before going to the press conference and give him like five or 10 minutes. And I was like, I was marveling at that. And I I said to Woj, I'm like, yo, I respect the level of trust you have with these players. Because obviously they're going to tell him things. He can't write everything, but he might be able to write 1%. But it's just that, just that professional courtesy that, those guys stop in, they trust him, give their real thoughts, and then he reports whatever. But it's that same thing with with Rogers. You know, he trusts you, you're a friend, and uh, and obviously that's why you got two hours with him. I mean, he's a tough guy to get to. So it's congrats to you. That's sick. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I mean, he. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. It, it's a weird thing talking to your friends too. I, I felt like at the same time, I don't want to ever like exploit that. Right. And have right. him on. Uh, that's why I told Aaron, I think it was like episode 49 or something. And I made a joke about it right off the bat or the right at the beginning. Like, hey, we uh, I always knew episode 49 was going to be special. and We wanted to get you on here or whatever. And he because he was saying, oh, all, you've done 40 some episodes and you finally get me on. It, it might have been <laughs> episode 60 something. I I can't remember at the now okay. off the top of my head. But um, yeah, that's that's a thing. With with guys like the trust is such a big deal. I, I just had Mike Silver on, and we talked about that, like trust and trusting the media. And that's the thing they'll tell you from the day one. Like when you get in the NFL, the media people, there's PR staff everywhere, and they'll tell you nothing is off the record. Don't ever trust the guy when he tells you it's off the record. That is not true. 
And do you do you believe that? Uh, I, I do because um, the strength of what like I rely rely so much on relationships because guys don't have to talk to me. Like they could just if they want to be fun, they could just do a fun video on Instagram or on Twitter or something. Um, so to me, yeah, things are off the record. Like I'm, you know, you just, you just know by the type of conversation you have with someone, they're like, oh yeah, this isn't something for public consumption, you know? So the, and like, you just, you just get, you just get a, just get a sense. I mean, you know, you knew when you were talking to some guys you could trust as a player and some guys, yeah, you're just going to give like cliches to death and you're just going to, yeah, you know, we played our game and <laughs> 60 minutes of football, all that kind of stuff that you guys used to say in abundance you know there's one guy you might give a little bit more to. Very true. It, going back to the NHL thing, that is a, a thing that they I feel like, and I'm ta- talking to guys, they do suppress the personalities of players. Is, where does that come from? Is that from the top brass in the NHL? I think it's just the culture. Like, it's been decades of guys, like, there have been some, obviously some unreal talent and some huge scores, but Ovechkin... You know what? I think the European guys had a little bit more flair, whether it was a Pavel Bure, even Sergei Fedorov. His his personality was subdued a little bit. But Ovechkin, you know, I was saying one of my boys um, used to play for the L.A. Kings. We were having burgers somewhere like In-N-Out Burger or something when we were in California, which is my go to spot. I got to find the In-N-Out Burger in Ohio. Like what? Whether it's in oh. it's in Columbus or Canton or Cleveland, like the local spot that is like the legit burger joint. Um, but I was saying if Ovechkin was an American and he played with the same personality, he would be on par with like baseball players. Like he would have that level of fame because um, he's so much fun to watch. And, you know, basketball players, probably the most, um, they probably the most outward personality. And some football players, Cam Newton, Josh Norman, Odell Beckham Jr. They have pretty big um, personalities and stuff, but it would just help the game would help the casual fan. I think get into the game a little bit more if more guys were just a little bit more free. But yeah, it totally comes from the culture. Guys in the rooms will will, they'll chirp. If if you do a commercial, guys will make fun of you. Or if you have, I don't know, you'll you'll score a hat trick and maybe your celebration was too much. Guys will chirp you. It's kind of weird. But that's totally the culture. I know. I wish they would. You're right. For the casual fan, the person like me that doesn't know anything about hockey, but I enjoy watching it. Like I don't even understand icing offsides. People <laughs> they try to explain it to me. I'm like, all right, man. I don't. I mean, like soccer offsides. How's it work? And, and so I, like I said, I don't claim to know anything about the game, but I love to watch. Would you say Jeremy Roenick was one of the the bigger personalities as an oh, American? For sure, probably the biggest. Probably the biggest. Like he was awesome. I mean. You know what the what the movie Swingers did for Jeremy Roenick's career is like, it's like goes hand in hand. I mean, just you know the I think it was Vince Vaughn was playing with the Blackhawks and he beat up Gretzky and that's just such a legendary scene in a cult movie. And Roenick was like perfect. I wish I don't I don't think he won a Stanley Cup. Like I think he played in Philly, San Jose, Phoenix, obviously Chicago. I don't I think he went to the Cup Finals. I think they lost to Mario Lemieux in '93, but I wish he won a cup. But he was great for hockey. Like. And I don't know if you've hung out with him. He's an avid golfer, but he has stories for days, dude. I mean, he you could – like, Ronick's the type of dude – or, or che- oh, dude, Chelios. Here's a story for you. Chelios, when he had – we're talking about you're a Jordan guy. Mm-hmm. When Chelios was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame, it's, in, it's here in Toronto. This is probably 2012, 2013-ish. Chris Chelios had an after party at Wayne Gretzky's restaurant. So Wayne Gretzky was there. Kid Rock was there. Kid Rock's from Detroit. Um, uh, oh my gosh, Cindy Crawford was there. Um, John McEnroe was there. Like all these luminaries. And then Michael Jordan was like flew to Toronto to be, be a part of Chris Chelios' celebration going into the Hockey Hall of Fame. That's how much of a G Chris Chelios was or is to have the greatest of all time leave wherever he was, take a private jet to fly to Toronto, and then enjoy some you know, cigar and some, some, some drinks or whatever for Chelios, like that's sick. And I know that dude, he can tell some stories. He has, he's had, he has this like legendary, he lives in Malibu, has this legendary summer party where like all these Hollywood stars were just like, one of my boys lives across the street from him and he played, um, this, this dude named Sheldon, sorry, no longer plays, but he played for Anaheim and they played together in, um, 
damn, I can't remember what team they played together. Either way, lived across the street. So one time he was at Chris Chellis' house and there was like a barbecue. It's a, it's a day party. It was, first of all, those are what he had. Doesn't have night parties, day parties. And Tom Cruise just showed up at his party. It was like Tom Cruise, like for a good probably 15 years, was the biggest star on planet Earth. Yeah. Was at Chellis' house, enjoying a burger, whatever, a beer, just have, you know, having a good time, listening to music friggin' guitars come out. I was like, this is sick. So I don't even know, I've never, like I met Chelios once and he thought I was a very strange person, which he was correct. But like those kind of things, I would just want to just soak up that environment, just like see all these like hugely famous dudes and just hear the stories. I'd be like just a little kid, just like, whoa, hearing dudes drop the F-bomb or say mother F or, or just like have a crazy story about Monte Carlo and some crazy gambling story. Like that would be sick. Anyway, I know I've totally went off the rails here, and I totally de- uh, derailed your podcast. No, but that's, that's what just- it is, man. That's what this is. It's, it's a conversation. I love it. Those are the good. Would you? Do you wait? Wait. Do you share any great like? Do you share stories? Are you a little bit like I don't want to tell like, or do it? Do, do we have? Do I have to like come to Ohio and then we catch a hockey game? And at the hockey game, then you can be like, man, this one time at friggin' whatever. You know, Man, I don't I see that's the thing. I, I almost feel like I don't I don't share many because I don't have many stories like the stories I have may be fun with the guys that I have played with. But it's just because we're making fun of other guys we played with that are just <laughs> just dumb stories or we're making fun right. of directly to their face of the guy. Just like just dumb golfing stories or whatever. And how yeah, how those, guy, are great too. those yeah, are great too. Yeah, I don't have those crazy Malibu day party Tom Cruise <laughs> showing up. I don't have those kind of parties. I mean, Chelios and Ronick and Ronick was actually on. He was on the podcast and I, I see him out in Lake Tahoe every summer. This golf thing for uh, American oh, Century. So he's the best man. But uh, I don't have those kind of stories. Those guys played like that was like the the golden era before social media, before everything. So they truly, they truly lived it. Yeah. And well, you kind of, you were right at the beginning. Like you were obviously fully in the league as the Twitter was, I think Twitter started to rise in popularity like 09 ish. And mm-hmm. then, well, Facebook was like 04, 05. And then Instagram was, I don't know, like 2012 or something. Yeah. So, I mean, your, your days at the Ohio State, and then early Green Bay, like it's probably who like you probably have some teammates that are like that they're so thankful that they played right be- before like social media became huge, oh, right? Everybody, every everybody my age was so excited that so yeah in college I'd say it was the very end of it. Facebook was was going on when I was in college. I graduated in '06, but it wasn't like the up to date. Hey, someone takes a picture while you're at a bar and says, hey. Right. Troy Smith is at Alcatraz, which is an old stomping ground for guys that played <laughs> that I played with uh, at Ohio State. They didn't. There wasn't like the real time updates. Maybe I don't know. I didn't have Facebook at the time, so I have no idea how it went. But you could actually enjoy yourself and not have to worry about everyone taking pictures. You could still take pictures, but it was probably on a flip phone or a uh, trio. If yeah, you remember that. Shout yeah. Out to the trio. Yeah, man, I had a trio, so Me too. <laughs> it was a lot better. It was a lot better when it comes to that. I've even had buddies text me pictures or something about or like a link to a story of like these college kids that go and not even like pretty i mean stuff do that's not even bad stuff that you shouldn't really get in trouble for but they catch a bunch of heat because someone took a video of them at a bar and they weren't hitting girls or anything but just i don't know bonging a beer or doing something to where these guys have to like come out and publicly apologize for not putting the team first or something and we're like, man, I get texts all the time. Guys, are like, man, I'm so happy we we missed all that. Can you imagine being in college now? And I, no, I really can't. <laughs> Certainly, of like guys of your ilk who had so much visibility on campus, it would like Alcatraz. First of all, is a hilarious <laughs> name for like a stopping ground. Like, I wish I had put in a few shifts at that place back in the day. But yeah, for 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 football players who are usually or the basketball team were usually like the most visible dudes on campus. You guys must have felt like prisoners sometimes. Like you couldn't go to certain places just because you knew that people would be, you know, stories would be going around or people would be showing up with their phones. Like nowadays, I can't imagine how anybody just, they would just have to have parties in their, don't, not like their apartments or somebody's mm-hmm. house. Like they can't go out and just enjoy a night in the town because they're just, people just taking pictures and videos all the time. Oh, you would. And for the, the people coming in, I don't, I think you're not even safe at your own house party just because you know, there's people are going to bring their, their friends of friends and their buddies are going to come in 
and yeah. the, unless what are you gonna get them all to sign NDAs and they have the old Der, the right. Derek Jeter cell phone bucket at the front? <laughs> Dude, and Jeter, yo, speaking of that, Jeter was like ahead of his time. With I heard a story, it was in like GQ or Esquire in the early two thousands that he had a birthday party at St. Jetersburg, and that's where he put the the phones in a in a basket. So I'm here in Toronto. This girl I used to talk to like a year ago told me she had a similar Justin Bieber story. And and I don't mean to throw shade at Bieber. He's a huge star and very talented kid. So she works at a at a nightclub and so um Bieber, the 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 girl working the his booth, he's like, yo, invite some of your girlfriends, come back to the hotel. So she rounded up like six, seven girls that go back to the hotel and as soon as they get there, the, the his like security phones, boom, go in. The girl was like, I was so upset because I wanted to get a picture with Bieber. I was like, you gotta expect that. You can't yeah. be taking photos like and at like at the after party with freaking Bieber. Like, come on, the guy's so much to lose. So anyway, so everybody's enjoying the after party, let's say. And at one point, this is the kind of weird thing. He was playing his own music. So it's like that famous like Aziz Ansari story about Kanye when he went to Kanye's house and Kanye was listening to his own music. It was a similar thing. So at one point, B was like, everybody, shh, everybody, shh, shh. Because he wanted to hear this one part of how he sung his own song. Oh, it was like no. so weird. And I've, I've only met the kid once and he was super nice. But I just, I mean, I don't even know how you, I don't even know how his buddies let him live that down. Like, yo, we're not playing your own freaking music at our own after party, man. Like, come on, man. We can play some Drake or some Jay-Z or somebody else. So I thought that was, it's just a oh. little, little glimpse into that level of fame and that what those experiences are like for certain after parties. Oh, it would have to be. I would. He, he can't have any true buddies if that's the way I see it. Because if he had any guys that weren't on the payroll and weren't just yes men, they would do that. They would turn it off instantly. Like you have to yes. be kidding me, man. Yes. That's not real. <laughs> Imagine you had an after party and then you just had your own highlights playing, just like <laughs> uh, your friggin', you know, your the, the Ohio State highlight reel for forty four minutes. You just, you know stuffing you know yeah uh, runs at the goal line sacks all that kind of stuff I mean, you just your dudes just rip you mercilessly it, it would never ha it would never make it into the dvd player or whatever it would be it, it would be like me playing my high school highlight tape with the rocky four soundtrack going the whole time <laughs> yes. like that doesn't that doesn't happen to people that have people they're close with yes exactly exactly and he just clearly doesn't have any boys doesn't have any close dudes unfortunately unfortunately did so how to go with that girl are you guys still talking uh no we're not we're not we're not friends anymore was it because of bieber <laughs> <laughs> let, let, i i feel like bieber got to meet her in a way that i experienced her in a way that i never got to so i believe that's how that story ended and that's like many girls that i know here in the city just that happy ending i just never got it you oh know I mean? no is bieber a toronto kid he's from um stratford which is about 90 minutes outside of toronto so when he was making his his rise to fame, were you aware of him? Um, only when he blew up, because he was like this YouTube sensation, and he was basically like a busker. He'd be playing, so his grandma or one of his relatives would just take him to like around a bus station or just like on the street in the streets of Stratford, and he would just be playing his guitar and singing for hours and then just you know has a little basket of change. I think some of these videos are on YouTube, and then he was discovered by Usher, and uh, Usher or Scooter Braun, and that's how. And there was a bidding war between Usher and Justin Timberlake, who were kind of like rivals in the music industry because they're in the sim similar genre, pop music, R and B. They both can dance like like Michael Jackson. They're both pretty good performers on screen and unbelievable artists. So that was um, that's how he kind of he came to fame. He was maybe the first YouTube sensation or the first handful of youtube sensations so does usher get a he gets a cut of everything bieber does huh i don't i wonder he he was on um i believe he was on usher's label but i don't know if that's if it, like if that contract has lapsed yeah or if it's tried to re-up or whatnot but i i believe he usher must be getting must have gotten some checks of from baby featuring Ludacris or whatever those early friggin' jams were that were you go on YouTube now, they probably have like 1.7 billion views. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure Usher is still eating very nice. Ludacris, that's awesome. I, I was at um, a golf thing that Derek Jeter was actually the host of. He took over Jordan's golf event in Vegas, 
And oh, I, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went a couple years ago with my brother actually came out because my wife had, was pregnant and couldn't come. And Ludacris performed. And oh, sick. it was in like this ballroom of a Vegas hotel with like a bunch of old middle-aged white dudes. <laughs> and when we heard Ludacris was playing, my brother and I were looking like, this does not really seem like a hip hop crowd to me. It just right. feel, it felt weird. I was like, man, I feel bad for Ludacris. But I give that dude credit. He came out and played for like an hour. And I was shocked that I knew every song. I'm like, oh, this is I was like, this is ludicrous. I had no idea like all the songs he has. Like, he has a ton of hits, man. And he had these these old dudes up on the dance floor going the whole time. Oh, nice, nice. That's that's awesome to hear. Actually, that I I went to. I met. Have you ever you've met my MJ, right? Just barely in passing. Yeah, at this at, in Tahoe at the golf event I was at. Yeah, I similar. Like I've I've spoken to him. Well. Maybe like twice, but they weren't very long conversations. And he's fully the guy that I'm like, I get nervous around because I have such a reverence, and you probably do as well because oh, it's God, yeah. Michael Jordan. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, would you? So that, would you? If you got to interview him, would you put your arm around him? Yes. You know what? I, I the very first time I did interview MJ, I um, I hugged him like. Uncomfortable. Oh, I, I saw it. He, you actually, you, you really broke down the wall with him. I remember it was on a golf course. Yes, yes. I yes. saw that because you hugged him and he smiled and every, like he, you really. I felt like you, you, uh, you have a little soft spot in his heart now. <laughs> then and the next time I saw him was at his golf tournament in Vegas, and he, I think he maybe remembered my face because not people just aren't going to hug Michael Jordan like randomly with a camera crew and stuff. Yeah. And he's like, Oh, I, 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 uh, I met you at the beginning of your career. I was like, yeah. And then I gave him this, like, I made this print for him. It really sucked. It was like, it was like a Beatles. The Beatles had this one album cover, just, and it was just the Beatles. And it was the four faces of the guys in the band. So I, I made something called the Michael. So it was Michael Jordan, Mike Tyson, Michael Schumacher. No, Jordan, Tyson, uh, Michael Jackson. And, I think Michael Schumacher or Michael Phelps, but it wasn't very, so I gave it to him. He's like, oh, thanks. And he just handed it to one of his guys. I'm sure that he left that at the, at the golf tournament that particular day, but I gave him a t-shirt that said, it was the Jay-Z line from that song, Paris. It was like, uh, Jackson, Jordan, Tyson. No, what is it? Uh, what does he say? He says, uh, Jackson, Tyson, Jordan, game six. And he's like, thanks a lot. And I was like, and I just asked him like, hey, when, when Jay-Z is going through the Michaels in that song, Paris, did you expect your name to be last? It's like, no, I was just happy to be in it. Wow. I'm like, well, you're MJ, man. Like, of course you're going to be mentioned in a friggin' song by Jay-Z. Jay-Z mentions you all the time. And Jay-Z is like the coolest in hip hop. So it's just, it's just, it's pretty sick. Speaking of, uh, of Jay-Z and hip hop, how do you feel about Kanye and his whole, whatever he does right now, his art that he's creating? <laughs> That's the, yeah, it, it's, it's art. It's not, Hey, listen, I was at, do you have a pair of the Yeezy, the boots? Not the boosts, but the boots? Do you know I? Those, right? I, have, yeah. I have neither. You've not? Okay. So I was asking friends of mine, like, how would you wear those boots? Because they look like boots that would be like Luke Skywalker friggin' wore them in yeah. Star Wars 1 when he was on Tatooine. Like, that's what they friggin' look like. But, um, uh, and, but people rock it, and I just don't know how, like, you put your pants in the boot, or do you put your jeans over the boot? I don't know. I, I still haven't had like the definitive answer. But as far as Kanye's art goes, I respect him as a creative, and I and like I know his like his the best thing he does is the music. But he wants to design and he wants to do architecture and paint. And so I'm like, yo, just do all that stuff because I know you're a creative and you want to get all that stuff out of your brain. But I just love it that when he goes back to the music, he just gives us fire. And I play. I still play the life of Pablo. I skip some songs. But it's still pretty fire. So if you were born in America or you became a citizen, would you vote for him in 2020 when he runs for president? <laughs> I would um, <laughs> I would entertain it. I would be entertained by the TV show, much like we are entertained by the TV show that is the Donald Trump <laughs> presidential campaign. It's been hilarious for us for the past 18 months, or I guess maybe 14 months. I don't know what it's been like for you as an American, but for us watching – it's like so entertaining as a show. Oh, yeah. it's, it's it's beyond anything. Can, if you could have gone back in time for eight years and said this is what 
the political landscape was going to look like right now, especially so close to the election between Donald and Hillary, and especially with everything going on with the like every other day, there's new Hillary email links, email yeah. hacks. Yeah. Donald yeah. just continues his his whole game he's playing. And then just recently, I don't know when I'm, I'm going to post this. Not and it's probably for a couple of days or a week from now. Have you are you aware of Anthony Weiner getting in trouble again for texting pictures of his uh, his donger with his son in the bed? Yes, yeah. that's true. Uh, isn't this the third time or the fourth time? Yeah, I watched. Did you watch the the documentary on him? No, but I heard it's I heard it's awesome. It's like great. and his wife is like a big character in it, right? right? Oh yeah, and she's Hillary's right hand lady. So right. uh Huma, I guess her name is. And Anthony Weiner, that dude, I, I just I encourage you to watch that documentary. He let cameras follow him through this whole thing and then he was running for mayor. Right. And all of a sudden of he's all of a sudden he he thought he could win. He's like funny dancing in these parades in New York. Like he is such a character and such an egomaniac. But then he gets busted. It comes out again that he got caught sending pictures again during this documentary, during the filming. And they're in like the back room right before he goes out to face the press. And like Huma comes in and she's a part of the whole thing. So I couldn't believe he let the cameras stay the whole time. It was amazing, man. Man, I, I definitely, I got to find that on stream it or, or buy it or whatever. That just like, I was listening to that story and I was like gripped. I was like the, the amount of like, it was, I was getting flush in my neck, just like how awkward that would be. <laughs> like another, like haven't, man, haven't dudes learned? Like you just, you just, no. you just, you just, you go your neck down and you stay above the belt line. Yes, that's it. You stay, you know, that's, that's, if you're going to send it, one of, one of my boys who's a, a hockey dude, I asked him like, if he, you know, on Snapchat, does he send snaps back? He goes, he goes, when he gets snaps of, uh, the female form, let's say, mm -hmm. he just sends snaps back of him with his dogs. But he, because because we live in a screen cap culture now, yeah. So he's like, I'm never gonna get burned. I'll just send pictures of my dogs, and that's that's as much as I'll do. I'm like, well, you're smart. I'm like, I hope that friggin' Anthony Weiner catches wind of our podcast so that he can he can <laughs> apply that to his own life so he doesn't get in trouble again. Nah, no, no, like no chance. I'm telling you, man. It, you, so you're up in Canada, so the news might get to you slower. But it just <laughs> just just happened. <laughs> Uh, like page six or whatever it is, is it the New York Post or whatever it is that runs like the, the crazy headlines? Um, he took, uh, he DM'd like a picture to some girl with his five year old son next to him, and it's just like a picture, I guess, of him in his underwear, like with his dong outline, with his son sleeping next to him. What? Yeah, That's just not real. That's, That's I know it doesn't. It wouldn't if you wrote that into a movie script, it, especially with his name being Anthony Weiner. Like this can't be real. But that's not AJ. That's not that's that's got to be photo. I'm telling you, man. Go check out Google after this. It's it's legit. And Huma uh, is leaving him. She finally said like we're separating. She had his public statement came out. That is unreal. Like <clears throat> the the um, the lack of self awareness is like yes. Is at an all time high for that dude. Like what? It's that's that. I, I I actually don't believe it. I don't believe that someone could be that that idiotic and just. Be that. Like what? What's going on with that dude, man? Like he, that dude needs a an lot. intervention. That that dude needs some friends. You know what? He doesn't have friends. <laughs> Dudes would be like pulling by, like, "Yo, man, like, what's up? Like, do we we really need to have a talk? Like, come on, man." Oh, I'm, but what to get the question that I had? I'm like, okay, so say she leaves him now. He doesn't have. Does he not get that thrill anymore? If he's a, if he becomes a single man, does he like he's fully in he's fully capable and allowed to send these shots out like does he oh, go man. does he go crazy or does he go the other way and just shut down no no his his tinder profile and bumble those are just going to be on fuego dude he's just <laughs> going to be swiping to the right it's a numbers game it's like baseball like just get at just get just get at bats so <laughs> I, so i'd say for the next the, to the end of 2016 my guy's going to be swiping left like thousands of, and he lives in new york so there's like thousands of women there that he could um that obviously know his dirt and someone would just won't care so i'm just like just get just take those rips in the in the batter's box i'm sure he'll <laughs> be sending out a flurry of of those kind of picks yeah what he, tell me. yeah it doesn't even <laughs> you like me explaining that to you didn't even feel real i can't believe it's it's a real <laughs> thing that i voiced that I, I put that out there. I, I still can't believe that. I it's it's a thing, man. You'll you'll see. It's who knows how it's going to play out over the next. And just to not even, I didn't even put it together to right now. But just add that to this election process now. Like Huma is 
Hillary's late. That's her her person. Like she relies on. She's a big part of her campaign, her life, everything has been for a while. And now she's been dealing with this Anthony Weiner situation. Now she's separating from him a couple months before the election. Like, does this come into play? Does Donald Trump bring this up in the debates? Man, it's it's pretty ugly. Like there, there's just like I don't I don't want to say you guys, but <clears throat> some people treat Hillary so terribly, man. Like just the. The both the convention, not the both, but the Republican convention, like just some of the signs and the way the language that they, it's it's some of it's really really harsh, and it seems like neither candidate is holding any punches. Every other day, it's like you're a racist. No, you're a racist, or it's like yeah, you can't be crooked, Hillary. And then you know, Hillary, I, I did like her one tweet, like delete your account. That was pretty. <laughs> that was that was a savage move, but it was so good. It just a lot of my, this one's this one's pretty pretty ugly. But again, as Canadians are watching, we're kind of entertained by this whole ordeal. It's I think I mean the networks have to be so excited, like CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, it, all of them. There's ne- there was never a time when anyone ever watched like the primaries and the primary elections. No one it, people I, the ratings had to be like seven people before Donald started running. <laughs> then Donald gets on stage when he had like ten other guys and he yeah. he he instantly the the one that, that killed me. You talk about a savage move was when <laughs> I don't know if you saw it or not. Well, he was on stage like ten people and he before they didn't even ask. I think they asked him a question about something his immigration policy. And he's like, first off, how is Rand Paul even on this stage? He's in eleventh place. He's not even in tenth. I just don't understand how this guy is even here. And they cut to Rand and he's like kind of sweating. His tie was undone. He's like. <laughs> And he's like, what, what's, come on, man, we haven't even, like, no one's even said a word yet, and you just want to, you come at me right off the bat, and so I just couldn't believe when he did that, I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be an entertaining six months. Yeah, he's, he's like the Conor McGregor of, of right. politics, like, says anything, his trash talk game was pretty high, and, like, whenever Donald goes off script, that's when he just, like, is a total loose cannon. He's talking about the size of his hands, he's talking <laughs> about, he uses the best words, he's, like, just all this random stuff, which none of it is like, it's never very specific about policies or what, it, you know, his, what plans he's going to implement. It's just him taking shots at people. It is. It, it's something I, I, I want to know if you find this when you're interviewing people sometimes. So Donald is the king of, I was saw him with Anderson Cooper recently and Anderson is a legit journalist. And I think Anderson's yes. a great interviewer and he was trying to ask him questions and follow-ups and Donald would like almost shush him and just continue to talk and just repeat himself over and over and over and not give him a chance to have a follow-up or even ask him to explain what he was talking about. Like, do you ever find athletes or people do that to you? And if so, like, how do you, how do you go around that? I have, I, I haven't really experienced anybody quite like Donald Trump, someone that is most guys. Other than a, other than a rod telling you, okay, second question. <laughs> generally pretty short like that and uh i never feel like i get railroaded like someone has an agenda and they have to get certain things out generally i'm the one doing most of the talking and just being super annoying uh but some of the guys that have like big personalities that like to talk i always find that interesting and i'll just let them go with it because the audience is going to get entertained i think um like not that this is the same but um i know that when you when uh like i've interviewed charles barkley and Char, uh, Cha- uh, shaquille o'neal they're awesome. Like they're just professionals and they're both actually funny people. Mm -hmm. And I just want to hear them talk or tell stories. So I usually, I just know that when I'm interacting with those guys, just heave them a softball. They're going to go for like two minutes. Shaq's going to crack some jokes. Charles is going to be super honest. He's like a, like a grandfather with no filter and you're going to get great stuff. So it's never quite what Anderson Cooper has to deal with, with Donald Trump, but it's, so it's way more pleasurable for me and hopefully the audience gets a kick out of it. Now, what do you, uh, what is your pyramid of fame? I've heard you reference this before. Nice. Thank you, man. Um, Okay. So it was Kid Rock who came up with it. I think it was, it was uh, was TV stars, movie st- no. It's TV you're, stars. you're starting at the bottom, correct? The yeah, bottom yeah. of the pyramid. Yeah. So it was TV stars, movie stars, athletes, rock stars, and then Michael Jordan was at the top of the pyramid of fame. Um, whew, I don't know if Michael Jordan has been suppl- maybe for a younger demo. He's maybe it's. Bieber is at the top of the pyramid of fame, but for anybody over probably 30, 
mm-hmm. it's still Michael Jordan at the top of the pyramid of fame. I think maybe TV star. I think maybe movie stars at the bottom, and then TV stars. No, I think it goes. Mm, I think it goes. Rocks, rock stars, movie. No, movie stars, rock stars, TV stars, athletes. Michael Jordan. I think that's. I think that's how I would have the pyramid of fame in 2016. Yeah, I think I'm. Yeah, I think I'm with you. I uh, I think, man. I, I guess now his time has passed, but I think you could almost put Tom Cruise up there with Jordan for a while. Yeah, he had a man that run from like <clears throat> was like Top Gun, like '86 to like I don't know one of the Vanilla Sky or something. Like you know, the only run that's been like Will Smith had a good run from like, and I know like Bill Simmons loves to do these kind of like talk about a certain run, like Will Smith had a run from like Independence Day was like 96 to like, I am legend. That was pretty legit. And like Will Ferrell (laughs) is probably still on a run from like Anchorman till actually I think the movie he did with Kevin Hart was uh, so, so, but Anchorman to like, I don't know. What was the the last great Will Ferrell movie? See movie. uh, I think Will Ferrell was amazing in uh, Eastbound and Down. Yeah, he was, he was, he was unbelievable. Yeah. He was, what was it? Ashley? What was it? Ashley something? Ashley was, Schaefer? I think, yeah. Something like that, yeah. With the sweet, um, like the Ric Flair looking hair. He was amazing. Yeah. He was, um, um, and like him and Danny McBride, both guys who play characters with unearned arrogance <laughs> and have no self-awareness and the worst mouths. And it's just amazing. Like, it's just incredible. And I watch Vice Principals because of Danny McBride. Like, I want Danny McBride to play that guy. I will give 12 bucks or friggin' buy HBO Go so I can watch that character in various forms because I just love it. Like, I love what, you know, that the, what was it? This is the end where <clears throat> all the guys are just ripping each other. He just had the best one liners, just killing the other actors, Franco and Rogan and Jonah Hill and all that. It was tremendous. Have you talked to Seth Rogan before? Once. Actually, for the movie, this is. This is the end. Him and uh, his uh, writing partner, Evan Goldberg. And those guys are great. I heard he, he has pretty good parties in L.A. where it's just everybody's in a heightened state of awareness. And the, <laughs> the smell is very green. It's uh, it's uh, it's an environment which Snoop Dogg can really appreciate. Yeah, I, th- the kind of parties I, that I think um, Kevin Smith credits Seth Rogen to, get, uh, to turn them on to smoking weed. Now Kevin Smith is all about it. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I don't know what movie they were doing together, but Kevin Smith is very public about it. I think he he was like all worried and crazy about this. Scene. I think he was directing Seth Rogen. Maybe I could be completely wrong. This is all allegedly for the, <laughs> for for the people. But uh, I think <laughs> he's. Probably- I think he said he went into like Seth's trailer and Seth was just in there before a scene. Or maybe during his off time at night, I think and he, he's just smoking, hanging out, and Kevin was freaking out or something. Like, what are you, what are you doing? We gotta, I gotta go through and edit this all night. He's like, no, here, relax, man. You'll be all right. Why don't you give this a shot? And I guess Kevin was, he was hooked ever since. Nice, and and Kevin Smith tells great stories too. So I'm sure whenever he told that story, it was like oh. 17 minutes, and it was just awesome and just hilarious. Oh, no doubt. Yes, yeah. Seth, Seth was talking about. Um, he was on Howard Stern recently. Because, oh, Sausage Party just came out. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about smoking weed with somebody. Oh, you was talking about the, the, the type. Oh, yeah, if, he, if Howard were to smoke with Seth, what kind of weed would he? And he, Seth had some particular kind of the, the happier version that makes you happy or whatever. It doesn't, like, break you down. He just, it, I mean, they're so specific. But, yeah, it, was, it, would, be, it would be quite, quite a scene to, to be in one of those parties. It would, man. Um, did you Have you ever taken part in one of those film junkets where you sit there and you get five minutes with like the actors while they're going through like 12 hours of interviews? Yes, man. I've done <clears throat> so oh. many of those. And sometimes you get great moments and other times you get not so great moments. Which, what, what kind of story would you like, AJ? Well, I would like to, I'd like to hear a not so great moment. First off, we all like a car wreck. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, th- dude, this just happened like two weeks ago. I was interviewing Jonah Hill for the movie uh, War Dogs. Um, and him and Miles Teller play these like gun gun runners from Miami in the, I guess during the Afghanistan or Iraq war, so mid 2000s, based on a true story. So on the poster, Jonah Hill is 
like firing an AK-47 and the poster looks exactly like the poster for Scarface where Al Pacino is like, you know, say hello to my little friend and he's just, just killing a bunch of people. So Jonah Hill, similar pose in the poster. In the movie, there are two scenes where he's just ripping off shots with automatic weapons. So in the interview, I ask him, so like halfway through, um, and actually I have the prop over there, so I'm gonna grab it for just to show you. Halfway through, I'm like, um, listen, America, you guys are the leaders in guns. Okay? You guys just dominate just guns in general. I'm like, but for a sports, in a sports way, you guys have, as far as accuracy goes, you guys have Steph Curry. You guys have Clayton Kershaw. You guys have Phil Kessel. I was, trying, I was giving him, suggesting athletes that were, that were like basically snipers. And then I said, you know, as far as big arms go, you guys have Aaron Rodgers and Serena Williams. Since you just filmed this movie, War Dogs, I want to know um, how, how skilled you are with the gun. And then he's like, um, so I brought, and I'll just, hold on one second. I yes. just... He's grabbing something for the audio listeners. A lot of people oh, listen. Sorry, for the audio no, you're okay. good. A lot of people listen on iTunes, but you're good to go. I want to see your prop. So I, I go into this little bag and I have this red and orange Nerf gun. Okay, this yeah. is what it looks like. Yeah, a okay? little, little kid's gun, like I'd give my five-year-old. And, and the bullets are plastic, red, and orange. So I said, "Hey, here's here's a Nerf gun." He's like, "Oh, bro, man, no disrespect, but I can't do anything with guns." And I'm like. Oh, well, it's a, it's a Nerf gun. He's like, yeah, no, man, I just, I'm just really against guns. I just can't do anything with guns. And, um, so I'm like, oh, uh, okay, because, but it's just a Nerf gun. And, and hey, so I go back into this little bag that I brought and I had like a cookie and it was a Blue Jay logo. I'm like, this would be your target. You just shoot at this cookie. He goes, oh man, yeah, thanks for the cookie. But yeah, no, I can't do anything with guns. So needless to say, I'm like, well, here's the cookie. You have that. Thank, thanks for your time. And he's like, hey, man, shout out to Toronto. Shout out to the Toronto Blue Jays. Thanks, man. I'm like, oh, no problem. So as I go into the hallway, I'm like, did that just freaking happen? I grab my stuff and I'm, I'm heading out the door. The, the, the publicist comes by. She's like, hey, so you're not going to use any of that stuff about guns, right? In this interview, I'm like, no, it was terrible. Like, he, he's like, no, I'm not going to use that stuff. And I, as I'm like looking over her shoulder, there's a poster on the wall inside of this hotel. We're at like the, the Ritz or something. And I see the poster over her freaking shoulder and it's him holding the gun. So I'm like, yo, you take a moral stand in a fun interview with a freaking Nerf gun, but in the movie, you're freaking blowing off like dozens of rounds or hundreds of rounds. Like I just, it was, it was a total car wreck. So that, that interview is, hasn't aired and probably will never air because it was just so awkward. Like too, like so awkward that it's not even funny. So that was that was one of the ones where it just, just was really bad. I don't, man, I don't get it. I don't understand really what, I I mean, sure, if people don't want to take a stand one way or the other with the gun issue, I could see him not wanting to like alienate part of his following, but shooting a cookie with a Nerf gun that my daughter uses is not yeah. taking a stand one way or the other. Yeah, I like if you're and I mean I, I understand you're an artist and maybe in the movie you're making a commentary about these kind of characters that are gun runners, because his character is like a total D bag. But yeah. I mean, is the is the audience at large going to get that? Hey, this is this is satirical, or are they just going to be fully entertained because you're doing blow? There's beautiful women in it. You're freaking shooting guns. Are they just going to are they just going to watch the movie on the surface and just like I don't know, man? But it was it was so awkward, AJ. I was like, yeah. I just don't, I just didn't get it. But it uh, it makes for a good story. Was Miles Teller with him during that? No, it was just it was just Joan Haley, and he was in Toronto the day before the movie came out. I don't know where Miles probably did some press for it, but I, he wasn't there that day. Okay, I was just I wanted to make sure because uh, Butnick, Jonathan Butnick, who I reference on here a lot, he hooked us up, me and you, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Butnick's girlfriend is Miles' publicist. Oh, oh wow! So, so he must have some serious stories, like he like. He loves my. They say they say Miles is the coolest dude, and he's awesome. They they were telling me this a couple of years back before Miles really seemed to to blow up. I think, and he's such a seems like such a talented guy. And they always talk, they always say great things about him. But I was I was thinking as you were telling that I'm like, oh man, if this is if the publicist was Lauren, I'm gonna this is gonna be weird. <laughs> but next girlfriend, <laughs> <laughs> the um, what was he was in? I think it was last year. He was in Esquire magazine. I think he was on the cover, and I think. In this story, he referred to himself in the third person, 
Um, so like he caught a bit of flack for that. And he was kind of like, I think the interviewer was like, oh, he's kind of too much of an actor guy. You know, Was like, he serious? He was serious? I don't know. Like the interviewer didn't, was, the interviewer, the way it reads was like, yeah, he's like, this is fully the way he is. Like he's, and he was making, he, he mentioned Jeremy Renner, who's also a guy that speaks in the third person, but I think he does it more, more comically. Um, and he just goes by Renner, but, um, yeah, I, I need to, I haven't met Te- Miles Teller, but I do want to, I do I have to reread that Esquire article. And he was it to, just to see if that was, if I'm remembering it correctly, that he's one of those guys, man, will you promise me that if you are interviewing somebody and they refer to themselves in the third person that you will just go with it and you say the same, well, Cabby would like to know if 100% you have to go with it and see if they even get yes. it. <laughs> yes. 100 that would be actually pretty funny i do get a kick out of i think maybe ricky henderson or yeah maybe the most yes. famous as the uh athlete that referred to him coming the third well ricky ricky feels like uh <laughs> ricky's, the, ricky's the greatest stolen base uh leader of all time and ricky like that's it was just so funny to me and being fully 100 percent serious yeah ricky's so, one of the i'm gonna go with it ricky's one of the few guys that i think gets a pass he can do it there was a there's a clip of Ricky, they were saying that this is how cool Ricky Henderson is. There, he refers himself in the third person, and he wouldn't even say his last name right. He said something like, "Oh, this, this is Ricky Henderson." Henderson, or like how he said it. It wasn't like he he honestly like chopped his last name up. How he said it, like, like he's so cool that he doesn't even have to say his last name right. <laughs> That's just tremendous. See, I feel like. I'm about to go on a YouTube, like fall down a YouTube rabbit hole looking for Ricky Henderson interviews. And I'll spend the next two hours like laughing by myself in my place at Ricky Henderson stuff. I think I feel like Neon, um, Deion Sanders maybe referred to himself in the third person. Maybe. Probably but as, not, but probably as sure. prime. Yeah, he probably as he, he referred to as prime time. Yeah. yeah prime. I, a lot of people around Dion, I've, I've been around him a few times. They call him prime. I mean, he goes by prime a lot. So, oh, does he? Yeah, oh, I don't. Okay. I don't know him well enough to call him Prime. I think I'd feel right. weird saying that. But yeah, I don't know, man. That's uh, did he give himself that nickname? I feel like probably, yeah. Maybe even in the Florida State, the those those years, probably. But yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure. Did you Did you ever play with a guy that had a, a as big per, uh, personality like Deion Sanders or or even Ricky Henderson? No, man. I, those guys are one of a kind. They don't come around very often. And it, in Green Bay, it, it's such a classy place, too. I was there nine years, and they don't, like, suppress any personalities or anything, but they don't they don't bring in guys, I think, that may be a distraction. I think you would think that – but you would, you would think that a, a person who was that flamboyant would be a distraction to the team if they had that kind of personality no i mean it all depends how they play on the field if they're if they're killing it there's a whole like there's an equation like if your garbage exceeds your play then you're gone right but no i mean i don't think it would be a distraction but i think a lot of gms and owners don't want to deal with anything they don't want to have to listen to some guy i don't know speak crazy after a loss or they just don't like to deal with with nonsense it's all football all the time we don't want like we don't care about your personality it doesn't matter but they don't like openly they don't suppress anybody they let you do whatever you want but at the same time i think they wouldn't it's not a place where you would want to i don't know go out there making waves like like the the colin kaepernick situation whatever whatever people feel one way or the other they i don't think any team really wants to have to deal with that the onslaught of that but right yeah that's and that's gonna i mean that's just people are just gonna like there's gonna be cameras just on Colin Kaepernick oh. for the game. Just like, oh yeah, he's sitting again, or oh, he's standing now, and that's gonna be a story that he's finally standing for the national anthem. And like, why is he standing now? Like that's man, it's like the NFL is one hundred percent a twelve month league. I think right. NBA is getting close to that too. And that's it's the soap opera for for dudes. I mean, I know obviously women are fans of both of sports as well, but for guys, man. <clears throat> This is this is our soap opera. It's like following the lives of these players and any little thing. I mean, obviously, I know he's 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 making a like a moral choice and and he has his views and he and he feels a certain way about injustices that happen in your country, but it's just the fodder for the so many people just to chew on it and clickbait and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's totally a that's that's totally something that would be I guess considered a distraction in the locker room because you if someone on your team that happened, you have to answer like you have to be 
you know, they're asking, you might even not have that great of a relationship with the guy, but you can't say that. Yeah. You have to be a, you know, you have to protect the house, so to speak. And you can't really speak your mind because that's probably going to cause more trouble than anything. Um, but yeah, those are, what would what, what a Terrell Owens or a Chad Johnson have been at their prime, would they have coexisted okay in your guys' locker room? Yeah, I think they would have just because the the culture is set. It's like when the Patriots bring guys in that may be considered a distraction. Like they had Chad Johnson, and it seems like guys kind of fall in line when they get around that culture and how it's run, and they just want to be a part of a winner and a championship. I mean, Randy Moss, same situation. He was he was beloved in, in New England. Uh, I think they, they kind of slide right in. They seem to, to fit in well. Who sets it? Like, is it – is it the most famous player on the team sets the culture or is it the like is there a locker room guy that is like maybe doesn't have a lot of fame but he's the guy that most of the teammates respect and like yeah that's you know a grizzled veteran or, or whatever I mean I think it's different I think it's set once it's set it, it takes a life of its own it doesn't even nothing even needs to be said it's just kind of how it is and everyone knows but it definitely helps to have a stud quarterback like the Patriots I think it's I don't know but I, I would imagine it's set with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady and now it it's that's what it is you're not going to come in and go against Tom Brady he's going to put you in your place real quick and you know I want to win and this guy gives me a great chance to win same thing like Aaron he he's the the true leader in in Green Bay for sure but Mike McCarthy came in my rookie year was his first year and he set the tone and we know like you you know right off the bat that that he's the boss and he's going to hold you accountable and I think guys respect that and guys like when you're held accountable cuz they don't want to see some guy strolling in late hungover whatever it may be and getting rewarded maybe for things they want to they want to know that you're held accountable and that if you're a guy that's doing the right thing that your opportunities are going to be there still. Okay, but you're you're a defensive guy, and I know that the offense and defense, you guys are obviously in the same locker room, but you guys have separate meetings, you have separate sides of the of the field that you practice on. So who was the defensive guy that was the dude in in your time, the nine years that you're in Green Bay? Was it Woodson? Yeah, I would say Charles did it from like a a quiet, uh, experienced type way Charles, so, but he wasn't the ray lewis type no person. no charles was very quiet like unique like thinker but when he spoke guys really listened and he he would he would definitely speak uh, at times before games at halftime during the game you know he was such a competitive guy but he wasn't a guy that was gonna like rah rah and run around before uh during pregame or in the locker room and get the guys together and give crazy speeches every game that wasn't his thing but you knew like this dude's one of the best ever, and you respected so much what he, how he prepared, how he worked during the week, and what he did on Sundays. That it's yeah, he he was a guy. I think everyone kind of looked up to. Do you ever, if if the Ohio State beats Michigan, that's always that eleventh game or that la that final game of the regular season. The next day, you know, the the, the game day or or the, if you guys have Monday nighters, would you you guys reference it to each other because you're both alums of those schools? I mean, a little bit. With Charles, because other people would ask us. That's kind of how it would go. Like media people, like the Michigan Week when Ohio State's playing Michigan, they would uh, they would ask us. Oh, do you? Hey, Charles? You don't say you don't say the Ohio State. You say Ohio State. No, I still say the Ohio State, but not every single time I say it. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's asinine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Please continue. I wouldn't Please say continue. when it's uh, Michigan the Ohio State Week. Like, no, that sounds <laughs> stupid, man. What a douche. That's like yeah. well, AJ says, like Hawk says. I'm not going to speak in third person either. <laughs> But uh, people would ask us all the time, and the, luckily for me, when I was uh, there, Ohio State had a pretty good run. I don't know what the record was against Michigan, but there wasn't a whole lot of talk uh, going back and forth, I think, because Charles knew like it was an uphill battle for them while, while we were together. <laughs> Dude, I am a fan of the Ohio State. So I say the Ohio State, and I didn't even you go should. there. I just, I just revere the school, and I got, I got put on to Ohio State because um, when I was in high school, the, my – I was a linebacker and a running back, and my coach said, "You need to watch a guy named Eddie George." Yeah. So the year I, I and all our all your guys' games were on ABC, which we would get like the local Buffalo Philly, because Buffalo is about two hours away from Toronto. So I watched him during his Heisman season. I'm like, "This guy's amazing!" And then I, you know, I followed him to Houston, and then they became the Tennessee Titans. But I was so I don't know which I don't know who's credited as the first person to say the Ohio State on that mon on the Monday Night Football broadcast, mm -hmm. but I say it. As a total douche, and I have, and I never went to your school or anything like that. 
Well, we appreciate it. Us Ohioans, we, we definitely appreciate it. I still, I definitely say the Ohio State. And when you have to do like your intro, you know, AJ Hawk, the Ohio State University. Like I would say the, <laughs> and no one like no one sends you a memo and says you have to say this or whatever. But I, I tell people all the time, it's on the sign on campus, the Ohio State University. Like that's the official name. Oh, okay. That's, that's what it is. Yeah, it's not like someone just pulled it out of thin air. Ah. Uh. I wonder who who do you think it was? Do you do you know when it first like you were you a rookie when and you you guys must have had some Monday nighters? Oh yeah. Um, was it were they were they saying were they doing that on Monday Night Football at that time? Oh yeah, it was in way themselves. Yeah, well before I got to the league, it was going on. Yeah, actually, yeah, Eddie George, you know, Eddie George would say it on uh, Monday Night Football. Yeah, he would say it because the Titans would be playing, I don't know, the Ravens or some or something like that, and or Pittsburgh, and he would say it there. Yeah, that's right. It was early. Early, early. I don't know, man. I don't know what it. I don't know who started it. That that's a great trivia question that I don't think anybody has ever answered, at least to me. I'm sure there's plenty of people yelling, yelling out their phones right now if they're listening to this. Of tell me, oh, how do you not know that? Being yeah. an Ohio kid, and you went there. <laughs> well, guess what, buddy? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can find out. I'm sure by what, what after this gets posted, your your mentions will will light up <laughs> and. It'll be cats that went to the Ohio State. Be like, yo, bro, man, what's going? What's wrong with you, man? Of course, it's. You know, whoever. Yeah, forget, what's up? Uh, this Canadian guy has more pride in Ohio State than you do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no. it was Eddie George who used the first one. I don't know. Maybe, man. Man, I don't know. Uh, well, Cabby, you gave me uh, you gave us a lot of great time, a lot of great energy. I, I always I was worried coming into this after watching a lot of your stuff. I'm like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, Cabby is such a high-energy guy, and I'm not naturally – I don't naturally come across that way on camera or on the mic, but I, I appreciate it, man. You, you bring a lot of juice to the room. You make everybody feel good. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I know that had had I been you know, in your guys' locker room at the time that you played, I would have sought you out and tried to get you to, to fool around. I would have had to, I probably would have had to push you a little bit to, to open up, but eventually I would have cracked you and I would have had, we would have had some fun moments. Man. Yeah, man. I wouldn't have been mad at you. I know those hockey guys and some of they, they say, oh, I forgot how close you talk to me. <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're <laughs> no, talking to them. It is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. You'll, you'll, when, we, when we meet, you'll be like, wow, you do fucking, or excuse me, you are very close to my face. You can say whatever you want, Kevin. We're not, there's no, I'm not tied to any network here this is okay, my okay. It's my own site. Right. you're good all right man cabby where can people find you they want to check your stuff out uh on on twitter it's uh at cabby and um a bunch of my videos are on youtube so they can just um search cabby presents and uh i've been fortunate to have uh they can like as you're a green bay alum i've had some fun interviews with aaron Rodgers, so they can they can check those out last year i got him to audition for the new james bond and that was a pretty fun bit so you yeah. guys can check that one out. Oh yeah, I know Aaron is a is a fan of yours. I think any any guy really is that, like you said, you change it up, you switch it up. And I've had a few of those over the years where I've become a guy named Dave Damashek works for NFL Network. I had him on here. I was gonna do someone set up. Hey, would you do this phone interview with uh, guys at the NFL Network? And going, I'm like, yeah, cool, I'll do it. But I had like preconceived notions of what it was going to be about it was right, right before the season was starting years ago and i'm like oh man all right well what are they gonna what's the hot topics now that they want to get into that i'm gonna have to give like dance around it and like give weird <laughs> cliche answers yeah. and i got on and instantly they were like high energy asking like off the wall questions and i i really got into it and it was really fun and i still go on Damashek's podcast a lot and go on his show and get to see him and do fun bits with him when I'm out at NFL Network. So it's a, it's like a long-term thing, I think. That's why we see you like repeating and Kobe Kobe always remembering you and giving you the whole the number thing and you get to have all this access because it is it's fun what you do. And I think guys like that change-up and us as viewers, we like to watch that because we don't want to listen to a guy – Tell us, well, you know, it's just got to play a good four four quarters. We're going to take it one play at a time, one day at a time, and put the work in. Like, no one – that's terrible, especially now with how the media is and with – there's so many different platforms. People want to hear and see what a guy's really like. Thanks, man. And I, and I try to do that my best. Try to just bring up the natural personality of the, of the athlete and hopefully the audience enjoys. Yes, good job, man. Thanks a lot, Cabby. We will uh, we'll look forward to uh, – you know, we'll record again sometime down, down the road, man. Thanks so much for having me, AJ. I appreciate it, man. All right, man. I'll see you. Thank you. We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at officialAJHawk 
to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on The Hawk Cast.